Thank you all for joining us this morning. We're so excited to be able to share um, this information with you all today. Um, our general agenda will be a um, quick introduction to our topic and to our speaker. Um, and then we'll discuss what urban paleontology is. And we'll talk a little bit about the connections between the um, next generation science standards and the common core connections. And then we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. So, um, we will be using the Q&A function and the chat box, so make use of both of those. Um, before we really dive in, <clears throat> we would like to share, oops, share a statement that has been shared on our museum social media channels. So in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, we're taking a quick pause in our presentation this Blackout Tuesday to honor and enact a day of focus on community involvement to confront and someday end systemic racism and anti-Black racism. We, the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County, stand with the Black community and we commit to be museums where everyone is seen, heard, and represented and respected. Seen, heard, represented, and respected. So we wanted to make sure we acknowledge the situation that is happening in our communities across the country. Um, so thank you for spending that moment with us. In an effort to make our programs more open and safe, um, providing a good learning environment for everyone, um, we and to make sure that we we are acting as museums of for and with Los Angeles. Um, we are acutely aware of the pain and outrage that our community is experiencing, and we understand if you may not want to participate at this moment. Um, again, it's being recorded, so you will have access to it later on. Um, in striving to create an environment of safe learning for all of our attendees, we have um, some examples of some community practices that we um, would like to observe today. We think these are great starting points for us, um, but I will open it up to our chat. If anyone has another community practice or group norm that they think would be helpful for today's program, we'd love to um, hear about that. Um, if anybody wants to put those in the chat box, I can read some of those out as they come in. And if not, that's fine. Um, but the ones that we've provided to kind of give us a starting point is to um, communicate directly, clearly, and with respect, um, to use active listening, to speak for yourself and not others, and to engage with mistakes as learning opportunities. These were from Jen Quartz's blog post. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. But if you think of things later on and you would like us to consider those for the future, please let us know. So we've got some poll questions. Um, we would like to know uh, your favorite Ice Age animal and why you decided to join today's workshop. So some, some options for you for your favorite Ice Age animal. Um, would be our famous saber-toothed cat, the western horse, Colombian mammoth, Harlan's ground sloth, uh, Territorn, um, dire wolf, coyote, maybe the ancient bison. Um, or if you have another one that's your favorite, we'd love to hear about that too. Go ahead and share that in the chat box. Um, and I will share the results of these when they come out. Seeing in the chat, Mammoth is the favorite. Um, we're getting a good response with the saber tooth cat, though, which is you know, understandable. One of our more famous animals. Ooh, someone's saying Pacific Mastodon. Okay, I like, I see you. Mm -hmm. Dire wolf, sloth, yes. All right, I'm going to end this poll and share the results with you all so you can see where we're all coming, coming from. Sabertooth cat wins for favorite animal. Um, yes, we've got woolly mammoth, mammoth, dire wolf coming in in the chat box. 
it's not letting you fill in the poll. Oh, sorry about that. I'm not sure what that what the problem was with that. Um, but then we were also asking why you decided to join today's webinar, um, predominantly to learn more about paleontology. You're in the right space. Um, oh, fantastic. I'm just reading some of these chat ones. We like the fuzzy, big and fuzzy saber tooth gap. Great. All right, well, thank you all so much um, for participating in that. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this poll. And we'd also love to know a little bit more about you um, and what brings you into this today. I see um, some people are here to share some information with their grandkids later. They want to learn more about LA's paleontology. Um, Jennifer would like to reminisce because she volunteered ages ago. That's lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, if you want to share what subject and grade you're teaching and maybe the city you're joining us from, that would be great. <laughs> um, we've got some people coming from Long Beach. Oh, Austin, Texas. Fantastic. Hello there. Howdy. Um, Las Vegas. Lafayette. Awesome. Second grade. San Marcos High Schools, Yukon, Yukon Territory in Canada. Wow. Highland Park, Burbank. So Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh, this is really cool to see where everyone's coming from. It's really, it's really like, uh, really cool to see all of this. So thank you all again for joining us. Oceanside, Berkeley. Fantastic. All right. Well, you can continue adding in those um, your introductions. I'm going to share a little bit about our speaker today. So Eric Scott is joining us. Um, let me pull up his bio so I read all the right things. He's got quite an impressive resume, as you can imagine. Uh, so Eric Scott is joining us today from his office to talk about finding fossils and dodging bulldozers in, in urban California. Um, Eric is the Vice President and Principal Paleontologist at Cogstone Resource Management, which is a California-based consulting firm specializing in paleontology as well as archaeology and history. He's a vertebrate paleontologist specializing in extinct Ice Age mammals and has conducted field work, field and museum work throughout the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and the Afar region of East, Eastern Africa. So he's also an adjunct in the Department of Biology at California State University, San Bernardino and a research associate of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and La Brea Tar Pits. And he has no sense of humor, as you will soon learn. Um, so without further ado, um, let's welcome Eric, and I'm gonna go ahead and let you take us into your fascinating underground world of urban paleontology. Oh, I have to stop sharing, sorry about that. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us from all over the place, it sounds like. Uh, I'm going to be talking, hopefully fairly briefly today, about some of the fossils that are coming up uh, from the Los Angeles subway, um, but also fossils in general. So uh, let's start off with one of these. This is actually a recent rendering of a, a ground sloth, a giant ground sloth. Paramylodon harlani is the name, and this was done by a paleo artist named Brian Eng. And this is based on some of the fossils that we've actually found from the, um, from the subway excavations. I wanted to get back to the diversity statement that we started with because uh, at a time when we are supporting the Black Lives Movement, it is at a time when we are reaching out to support people who are disadvantaged uh, or discriminated against, I think it's also important to recognize that there are any number of things that routinely bring us together. Uh, if you look at museum visitation, for example, at the La Brea Tar Pits Museum or museums throughout the country and throughout the world, uh, they, they receive huge visitation and from a wide diversity of backgrounds. Any number of people from a variety of different cultures and backgrounds and ethnicities will visit museums, frequently natural history museums, and frequently in appreciation of things like fossils. And so museums are, I think, essential in showing uh, how diversity can be promoted 
and they're also emblematic of how science itself depends on diversity in order to advance, bringing a variety of viewpoints and perspectives to evaluate the available scientific data is essential for moving science forward. And so museums and fossils are frequently kind of ambassadors for science and they're also a gateway to learning more about science. And in many cases, people will visit museums and look at fossils like this Colombian mammoth skeleton. And if they're like I was when I was a kid, they start dreaming dreams about going out into the, the wilds. This is actually Montana going out into the wilds of places like Montana and Utah and Colorado and looking for fossils like this Edmontosaurus uh, tibia uh, eroding out of the ground. And, and so this is what excited me and excites so many people from so many different backgrounds and, and perspectives about their ancient past and about how they can actually be a scientist. And one of the things I'd like to convey today is that you don't need to go that far away and you don't need to go to all those wonderful areas. In many cases, those discoveries are right there in your backyard. And this is specific to those of you who are uh, dialing in from, um, uh, from the Los Angeles region. This is La Brea Boulevard, and you're not gonna see a lot of fossils there outside of the La Brea tar pits, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. You just have to know where to look. And in this case, it's below the surface, underneath the streets, up to 20, 30, 40 feet down. And this is where excavation is ongoing for the Los Angeles Metro's Purple Line extension. It is a subway extension that eventually will extend uh, from Union Station all the way into Westwood and towards Santa Monica. And we are right now, Cogstone Resource Management is doing paleontological monitoring in this section of it. This is section one. And you can see here that there are a series of stations that are being excavated. This is where people will be able to stop when the subway is live, which will hopefully be in a couple of years. So we aren't monitoring the actual trenching below the surface done by giant boring machines, but we are monitoring the station excavations. And if you're looking carefully at this map, you'll see that there's one station in particular that is located near a well-known fossil deposit. This is the Rancho La Brea asphalt deposits that are world-renowned, literally, and have been for decades. Uh, for the Ice Age fossils being produced there. This is the richest site of terrestrial Ice Age mammal fossils known from anywhere on the planet. And there have been excavations going on there for well over a century. This is what some of the early 1913 to 1915 excavations look like. Here's just a fraction of the fossils that have been found there. So it is an amazingly rich locality. Uh, from 1913 to 1915, there were over three quarters of a million fossils produced. Excavation is still going on there today. And so now they're up uh, estimated over four million fossils are known from the La Brea tar pits. So putting a subway station next to the tar pits uh, has been for decades literally a cause for some concern. You don't want the subway development to necessarily destroy priceless fossils that otherwise you would never see. This is actually a, a New York Times article from way back in 1983. And even back that far, there was talk about putting a station near the tar pits because it's such a busy area, because people will want to get off at a station there. And uh, there was concern about that. If you look at a map of Hancock Park today, uh, facing north, that purple line is the underground extent of the purple line extension. It's going to proceed along Wilshire Boulevard underneath the actual street. If you look in Hancock Park, the actual aerial extent where the fossil deposits occur generally falls along the trend of this arrow. So that's where you're going to find the majority of the Ice Age fossil deposits that are already known from Hancock Park. So right here in the lower right hand corner is where you don't want to build a uh, subway station. Fortunately for us, the station is planned here at the intersection of Wilshire and Fairfax. And so it's well away from the major trend. And so even though there are paleontologists looking for fossils here, uh, we are anticipating that we aren't going to find any major deposits such as what we were found uh, elsewhere in Hancock Park. I don't want to just talk about the Ice Age fossils, though, because this is actually a, a diagrammatic cross-section of what the subsurface geological units 
is. And if you look, this little bit over here, that's the maximum ex extent of the tar pits. So they don't go as deep as all of the geologic units that have the potential to yield fossils. And in fact, the subway itself is uh, going to proceed lower than that, but it is still going to impact sediments from the ice ages that have the potential to can contain fossils. And so this is where, why we have, uh, why LA Metro conducted an exploratory shaft back in 2014 and sunk a series of excavations down. And the whole way down, there was a paleontologist watching all of the excavation, mapping all of the subsurface uh, sediments, the stratigraphy, and determining what the paleontological potential would be, and actually finding fossils. This is one of the fossils that was found in an older unit, the San Pedro Formation, which is deeper than any of the Ice Age fossil deposits that we know of from the La Brea Tar Pits. So over 4,000 fossils and fossil specimens, fossil fragments were found in that exploratory shaft and almost all of them were found in the uh, near shore marine San Pedro formation, which dates to about 330,000 years ago. Again, much earlier than the La Brea Tar Pits excavations. Most of these fossils were invertebrates, animals that don't have backbones, but there were some remains of vertebrates like bat rays and marine mammals and there was one freshwater clam also discovered. And you might be wondering why paleontologists are there. Well, this is an entire branch of paleontology that is driven by construction. It's known as paleontological mitigation. And in California, where we're living and working, paleontological mitigation is actually required by law. Uh, it's the process where if you are going to uh, develop a project, you're going to create a housing tract or a subway or a transmission line or a reservoir, you can't just plow through any fossils that are present on the area you're developing. Uh, by law, you're required to preserve them. There are also local ordinances in Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County. There are federal ordinances that require this. And so it's a way of making sure that as we, we, as we move forward to the future, we don't impact the past and lose priceless uh, fossils that otherwise would be destroyed. Um, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, is the main driver of paleontological mitigation. And while it is, uh, it's written to preserve fossils, it actually has kind of an old school feel to it because it asks, would the project in question destroy a unique paleontological resource or a unique geological feature? Uh, unfortunately, unique is not necessarily what paleontologists are looking for. I, as a paleontologist, I would love to find something unique, but uh, the mastodon skull that you're looking here from Hemet, California, was not unique. We had mastodon skulls before, we had mastodon skulls discovered afterwards, so while it's an amazing and impressive specimen, which we'll talk about in a moment, it nevertheless isn't unique. If you were to visit the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, the New Age of Mammals Hall, you will see this mastodon on display. This is a mastodon from Simi Valley. It was recovered as part of a mitigation project, and it is an absolutely spectacular find. But it wasn't unique. We have mastodon skeletons from elsewhere. So using uniqueness as a qualifier um, in paleontology, again, so finding something unique would be spectacular, but it's not necessarily what we look for. What we're looking for as scientists is a way to recreate ancient ecosystems and understand not just that mastodon, but all of the mastodons that lived and died at the same time, mastodons from other regions, and all of the other organisms that lived alongside those mastodons, and recreating ancient ecosystems and understanding how they changed through time, so that then we can apply what we learn from that to ongoing changes in living ecosystems today. Unique also constitutes a bit of a challenge because you can find unique things and not necessarily recognize it. This is a limb bone. Uh, please don't get excited about the spectacular preservation of this. It's actually really cruddy. I'm with you. Just no, nobody would be interested in this. This actually was discovered in an AMPM mini mart uh, parking lot excavation back in 1993. It was labeled large mammal in the field, came back from the field, and I swear I, I stared at this thing for weeks because on the one hand, it's really big. It's a sizable bone. On the other hand, it didn't look like a large mammal. The bone is so thin, it looked like a bird. But birds don't get this big, I thought at the time. Turns out I was wrong. 
this was a humerus of uh, an upper wing bone of an extinct kind of bird known as Aeolornis. And in fact, that humerus turned out to be the holotype for this genus. Uh, it had not been recognized as a separate genus before. It was at the time the largest flying bird known from North America. It is now the second largest flying bird known from anywhere in, the, in North America. Um, nevertheless, it was found because it was recognized as potentially being identifiable. Nobody in the field recognized it as unique or rare. They simply identify, recognized that it was identifiable and maybe we could identify it. So here's a way that a unique new find is discovered without even necessarily recognizing it at the time. And so what we look for as scientists is not necessarily uniqueness. What we look for is uh, fossils that can be identified. Fortunately, CEQA does re have other options that we can use when we are recovering resource. For example, CEQA defines a historical resource as an object or site that is significant and has scientific or educational value that may be likely to yield information about prehistory. And fossils, even though we don't tend to think of them as, as historic resources, nevertheless, they do fall under this umbrella. Any fossil you find that can be identified uh, can provide information on prehistory. And so in addition to the standard paleontology uh, uh, dialogue of CEQA, we also have this option to, to preserve the resources that we might be able to find. So what Cogstone paleontologists and other mitigation paleontologists will do is go out on construction site and watch excavation as it's taking place and look to see if any fossils are being recovered. And if they are being recovered, can they be identified? And if they can be identified, then they have scientific significance, scientific importance, and we collect them. And eventually they end up in a museum where other scientists will be able to study them. Paleontological mitigation involves doing field work in a slightly different regime than classical paleontology, and so you have to come a little differently prepared. Safety is absolutely paramount. So when we work with our paleontologists, when we work with construction companies, safety is number one. Uh, I think fossils are important. I think fossils are amazing, but I've yet to meet one that's worth anybody's life or anybody's health. And so we emphasize safety. And so our paleontologists, in addition to the usual paleontological terms, uh, 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 in addition to the usual paleontological gear, they will also wear safety vests and hard hats and so forth and make sure that they can be seen at all times and they can see equipment at all times. I've already touched on some of the fossils that you can see at the Natural History Museum that were produced by mitigation. Uh, the largest mitigation project I know of at the time it was running was to excavate Diamond Valley Lake down in Hemet, California. And this is an area that consists of farmlands and onion fields back when excavation started. Uh, but the Met Metropolitan Water District of Southern California decided to build Southern California's largest freshwater reservoir. And it was at the time the largest earth moving excavation in North America. And as they were working from 1993 on through the early 2000s, paleontologists were out there recovering multiple fossils, including spectacular remains like this mastodon skull. We've already seen what this looked like in the ground. Here's what it looked like when it came out of the field. This is Kathleen Springer. She was the lead scientist uh, for the study down at Diamond Valley Lake. Um, and just, uh, this is an area where people had been working for centuries, uh, and w if you include Native Americans, have been living there for millennia and nobody had the idea that this many fossils were underneath the surface just a few feet down and that is pretty much the story for many parts of California where you're walking across fossils you have treasures beneath your feet and you might not even be aware of it. The fossils uh, from Diamond Valley Lake were so spectacular that the good people of Hemet got together and built a museum, the Western Science Center. So if you're ever in Southern California and ever in the Hemet region, you can go visit and see some of these amazing fossils. They're on display, a uh, huge number of them on, are on display, including that skull I just showed you. And the reason I keep emphasizing the skull is that this turns out to be the holotype of a new species of mastodon that was only recognized a year or two ago. This is Mammut Pacificus. Uh, one of our guests today has already mentioned Mammut Pacificus. And it's just a spectacular specimen. And it turns out that this was a California localized species of mastodon. Though it's possible it may be showing up in a few other places, but 
we'll find out about that later. Not later this talk, later on, hopefully this year, depending on how things go. Fossils like this have also inspired artwork. This is more art by Brian Eng, and that's Max. Uh, Max is the nickname of that skull and the skeleton he came with. And this is what we think he would have looked like in life. And so this is paleontology as you classically think of it with specimens going on display in museums and artwork being done to reflect these specimens. And yet all of this was driven not by classic uh, paleontology as you think of it, but by mitigation paleontology, specifically recovering fossils from construction projects. Mitigation has even touched the La Brea tar pits, even though it's a classical site and excavation's going, been going on there for decades. Nevertheless, uh, it took decades for a museum to be built to house these fossils and show them off to the world. And in fact, this is downtown, or excuse me, the La Brea area, uh, the Wilshire district back in the 1940s, 1950s. And you can see right there in Hancock Park, there is no Page Museum. Well, in the 1970s, a gentleman named George C. Page, who became a millionaire uh, by sending California fruit back east wrapped in brightly colored cellophane, he decided to spend some of his fortune to build a museum to house and showcase the fossils from the La Brea tar pits. And so they looked in Hancock Park, they figured out where they could excavate, where they wouldn't hit any fossil deposits. They started excavation and immediately came up with fossils, which is typical for Hancock Park. This is actually a saber-toothed cat skull that was found uh, just as excavation was starting for the Page Museum. And what is interesting about this and what caught everybody's attention at the time is that it was articulated. The lower jaw is tucked into the skull and that's almost unheard of at La Brea. Usually the fossils are separated. Skeletons come apart, they disarticulate and you don't find this sort of thing. So right off the bat, it was recognized that this deposit uh, where they wanted to put the Page Museum was something new and different. And so the deposit was, was jacketed and separated and removed from the site. They were fortunate, this is 1975, uh, the excavators and the scientists were fortunate that this wasn't a deep deposit like we're used to at the tar pits. It was a flat tabular deposit. This is an aerial view of the extent of the deposit and the, uh, these are outlines of jackets. And the jackets that are brown are the ones that have already been excavated. The ones that are in light blue are the ones that still today remain to be excavated. This excavation took place in the laboratory and museum volunteers were working on some of these fossils back in the 80s. And you can see, so it's like a, an inside air conditioned excavation which is relatively unusual and relatively rare. Um, what was also relatively unusual and rare, again, is that the skeletons being discovered were semi-articulated. Uh, this is a scan of an old slide, so the quality isn't great, but you can see those are a whole bunch of ribs on top of some vertebrae, and the ribs are all pretty much in the animal's death position. Uh, this is one side of the rib cage, and then the vertebrae are the backbone. When you remove the ribs, there's the semi-articulated backbone, again, in its position, death position. When you remove those from the jacket, the other set, the other side of the rack of ribs was still awaiting discovery in those sediments. So this is really, really rare for La Brea, and emphasizes that despite the fact that the site has been producing fossils for literally decades, um, there's still more to learn there and more to discover. As recently as 2006, the uh, LA County Museum of Art decided to build a subterranean uh, parking structure. And while they were building that, more fossils were, uh, there was paleontological mitigation going on. In fact, the lead scientist for that mitigation was a former volunteer from uh, the La Brea Tar Pits who worked in the Page Museum lab. And as they were doing this work, they found still more fossils. Try not to be surprised at this point. This is what happens when you're excavating in Hancock Park. They found 16 new tar pit deposits as well as a whole series of jackets and one largely complete mammoth skeleton. And so you can't excavate deep conical deposits quickly. It takes time. And so rather than try and excavate them in, in situ, they simply put tree boxes around the various fossil deposits. They then lifted them out of the excavation area and deposited them in the uh, pit 91 compound where excavations have been going on in Hancock Park. And if you were to visit there today, that actually forms the core of the ongoing excavations at La Brea. This is project 23. And this is where if you visit La Brea and Hancock Park today, you can 
to see excavation still going on. And again, all of this excavation is driven by fossils that were recovered as part of paleontological mitigation. So once again, this is all really uh, a new and exciting branch, a new-ish and exciting branch of paleontology, producing fossils that otherwise you would probably never see. So as excavation got going for the LA Metro Purple Line extension, uh, we were re very much aware that fossils were likely to be encountered. And so we uh, had monitors on site. We were particularly concerned about the intersection, the station at the intersection of Wilshire and Fairfax. It is adjacent to Hancock Park. I've just shown you what happens when you dig in Hancock Park. You're gonna find fossils. And did we find fossils? Yes, we did. Here's one of them. That's part of a mammoth tibia or shin bone. Here's the other one. This is a camel finger bone, and that's it. That's all we found. All of that thinking, all of that planning, all of that looking for more tar pit deposits, whether deep conical ones or flat tabular ones, and we found a whopping two asphalt preserved bones. Try not to get too excited. And I should probably end my talk here because that's all the fossils we found but that would not be the case because we were also working the other stations. This is excavation at La Brea Station. This is where uh, La Brea Boulevard intersects Wilshire Boulevard and there's going to be a station there. And we found a lot more fossils there. This is actually a mammoth femur as it appeared. And again, keep in mind, this is underground. This is 20, 30 feet below the surface of Wilshire Boulevard. And this is what it looked like. This is what it looked like after it was plaster jacketed. That's uh, Jasmine Nolasco and Janice Basuga, who were the discoverers and excavators of that find uh, for Cogstone. This is what the uh, femur looked like when it came back and cleaned it up. This is a Colombian mammoth. It's similar to the mammoths that are being found throughout the Los Angeles Basin today and have been found uh, at the La Brea Tar Pits and are on display at the La Brea Tar Pits. So we know that these animals are common from the region. And so this femur was, we were excited, it was nice, but uh, it wasn't anything we didn't know before. We weren't finished with mammoths though, because shortly after that, this was, take a look at that. That is actually a mammoth skull as it appeared in the ground. And again, this is the subway excavation. This is below the surface. So if they aren't putting a station here, this, this organism would have lived and died tens of thousands of years ago, and you'd never know about it. You'd never hear about it. It would just stay buried uh, for the rest of time and yet now we're able to discover it. Uh, this is uh, usually, it sometimes happens with fossils that uh, the discoverers give them nicknames. And so you can just tell at a glance that the nickname of this one had to be Hayden. Um, I'm actually not sure why, but I'm not the discoverer, so I'm not going to comment on that. At the time we discovered it, the teeth were down and we couldn't tell if it was a juvenile animal or a female animal or whether it was a mammoth or a mastodon. If you look at these teeth, mastodons and mammoth have very different teeth. Mastodons are more browsing teeth and mammoths are much more grazing teeth. So it wasn't until we got Hayden out of the ground and back to the lab and started preparing the find that we realized that it was a mammoth. Hayden was a mammoth. We still don't know uh, whether Hayden was a boy or a girl. We may never know that. But we, in addition to knowing that Hayden was a mammoth, we know that Hayden was a subadult because right there you can see the gap between the, the earlier tooth, the baby tooth, which is on the bottom of the screen here, that had the animal lived would have eventually worn down and been pushed out of the mouth. And the tooth on the upper part of the slide above the arrows, that was the next more adult tooth that was coming in to replace the same as your baby teeth would fall out and be replaced by adult teeth. Mammoths do that sequentially. And so this was a young mammoth, probably six to eight years old when it died. Um, and again, we wouldn't know about this without the LA subway being developed. Uh, Hayden, actually, when you find a mammoth skull, that's usually pretty significant. So Hayden got literally national and international attention. This is Dr. Ashley Ledger. She is our paleontology field director and also happens to be a specialist on Ice Age mammoths. So she was ecstatic that one of the coolest fossils we found uh, was actually a mammoth. So this gives her something to study and compare to other mammoths from La Brea and from sites throughout North America. So quite an exciting find. We also prepared it for a briefly 
actually in the fishbowl laboratory at the La Brea Tar Pits. So we were able to do work there and uh, do it where people could come see it. And there's even a YouTube video where the assistant curator at La Brea, Emily Lindsay, talks about the importance of mammoths and the importance about paleontological mitigation in uh, finding new Ice Age discoveries uh, from the Los Angeles Basin. We've also been working with Emily, Dr. Lindsay, and with other staff from the Natural History Museum. This is uh, Alan Zedinak. He's the chief paleontology preparator for the Natural History Museum. And here he is talking with Kim Scott about Hayden and how to best prepare Hayden and best make sure that this fossil will be ready to be uh, housed at the Natural History Museum, uh, where it will end up at the end of excavation. So here he is working out how to continue to excavate Hayden. And he even came out and helped us jack at the top of Hayden so that we can actually get it ready to be cradled and then flipped over so that Dr. Ledger can actually come in and take measurements of the skull now that it's been prepared and compare those measurements to other mammoths th from throughout North America. I've been focusing on mammoths so far because they're cool, uh, but they are not the, we're not just finding mammoths. In fact, we're not just finding vertebrates. We're actually finding some rare fossils of plants. This is a tori pine, which today has a very restricted distribution in California and does not occur in the Los Angeles Basin. But it did during the Ice Ages. We actually have multiple finds. This is just our best cone, but we have multiple pine cones and multiple seeds of tori pines. We also have some marine shells of organisms that today only occur to the north. They don't occur off the coast of California. So we are learning a lot about the ecosystems. As I mentioned earlier, that's the thrust of what we're trying to do is not just find spectacular fossils, but also recreate ancient ecosystems and look at how they may have changed through time. That said, I am a vertebrate paleontologist and I like Ice Age mammals, and so that's kind of where my focus is. But while we've talked about mammoths so far, by far the most common large mammal that we find is bison. And we find any number of bison remains. This is a lower jaw um, that dates to, uh, uh, what is it, uh, right near the end of the Ice Ages. Uh, so we were very happy with this particular discovery. Uh, bison are the most common animals we find. Bison are the most common last large plant-eating mammal from the La Brea Tar Pits, and they are the most common large mammal from the Diamond Valley Lake area down in Hemet. So the fact that we're finding more bison than any other large mammal is consistent with what we're seeing in other large Ice Age fossil deposits from throughout Southern California. Um, move, uh, I've talked about Fairfax Station and how little we found there so far. I've talked about La Brea Station, but what caught us by surprise, and I'm not supposed to admit that, but I will. If you look at our mitigation plan, we hardly even mention La Cienega Station. This is an aerial map of the outline of La Cienega Station, and every one of those numbers is a fossil deposit that produced fossils. And look at the abundance of them and realize, again, that if LA Metro doesn't develop the Purple Line and doesn't put a station here, there have been people living in this area for centuries, for millennia. Just since I'm al I've been alive, this is Wilshire and La Cienega, that's Restaurant Row. That's where people go to eat at Lowry's Prime Rib and all those great eateries, the Stinking Rose. And for all of those decades that people have done that, there have been Ice Age fossils beneath their feet and nobody had any idea until now. And here at La Cienega Station, again, the most common animals are bison. And here's a bison skull as it appeared in the, in the excavation. That's the top, that's the nose over on the left. And you can hopefully see the eyes, the horns are a little obscured here. So we bring this back to the laboratory, we clean it up, look at the preservation. Keep in mind that this is not the La Brea Tar Pits. These fossils are not preserved in asphalt like they are at the La Brea Tar Pits. This is natural preservation and this is just a spectacular find. That's a virtually complete bison skull of the extinct species uh, Bison antiquus. Here's another bison skull. This is Bethany. She is preparing the skull. She's not only one of our best field people, but one of our best laboratory people. And she's carefully preparing a, around that branch that you see is shoved in this skull's nose. Um, hopefully you can see that. That's how this uh, bison skull got nicknamed Vlad, because it's Vlad the Impaled. Yes, you may laugh. Um, all of, almost all of the bison that we are finding are the species Bison antiquus. And I say that because that's the classic interpretation of bison. 
recent genetic studies have demonstrated that living bison and fossil bison and, and fossil bison like bison antiquus and even earlier bison like the longhorn bison commonly known as bison lanifrons uh, that they're all genetically the same species. Nevertheless, we do have different anatomical constructions of bison and different sizes of bison appearing in North America at different times. And so even if genetically they're the same species, the fossils themselves and their anatomy and their abundance has a story to tell us about how these organisms evolved through time. And so as we're finding all these bison antiquous remains, we were curious about whether there were any longhorn bison in the area as well. There are just a few bones of longhorn bison at the La Brea Tarp. It's not too many, but we were still hoping to find some. And in May of 2019, at La Cienega Station again, we did. That is a longhorn bison. There's nothing else you could call it. We actually measured uh, the the horn cord. This is the bony inside of a bison horn. And both of those measurements fall well within the published bison range. This is also a juvenile animal. This, uh, the, the sutures on the, this part of the skull had not fully fused. So this is a subadult or juvenile animal. It wasn't a full-fledged adult. Nevertheless, it had this enormous long horn. So even in the sample, even outside of La Brea, in a non-asphaltic sample of Ice Age mammals, from the Los Angeles Basin, we are still seeing that these animals were sufficiently abundant to be recovered and represented. So again, we're very excited about some of what we're finding. In addition to bison, which are grazing animals, and mammoths, which are grazing animals, we find other grazing animals like horses. We actually find relatively few horses. I'm not quite sure why that is. They're the second most common large plant-eating animal at the La Brea Tar Pits, so we would have expected to find quite a lot of them. So far, we haven't. We found horses like this horse tooth. Uh, you're looking at the wearing surface of the tooth. If you were a piece of grass, this is the last thing you would see. Uh, but this is one of the very few horse fossils we found. We've also found some remains of the ancient camel. Camels and horses, by the way, are native to North America. That's why we find them here during the ice ages. And this is a camel limb bone as it's being prepared in the lab. So again, horses and camels have also been found at the La Brea Tar Pits. We are now supplementing the record from the Tar Pits with these new discoveries. However, some of the camel bones we're finding have different information that accompanies the fact that they're camels. This is a juvenile camel bone, and you're looking at the opposite sides. The top is the, the dorsal or front surface, the bottom is the ventral or back surface. And if you look closely, you can see that there are puncture marks from where this bone was chewed by a carnivore. So we actually have not just a juvenile camel preserved here, but we have ancient carnivore behavior that's preserved here as well. So that was quite exciting. This isn't the only camel fossil that we found. We have other camels and horses that show evidence of scavenging, uh, uh, predator ravaging. We also have some that show evidence of weathering. So the bone sat out on the surface for a prolonged period and then eventually was buried in a natural setting. Not only do we find evidence of the carnivores, we find remains of the carnivores themselves. So for all of you who voted for saber-toothed cats, yes, we do find saber-toothed cats. We've got a couple of different vertebrae. We also have some dire wolf finds. Um, so the carnivores in any assemblage are going to be relatively rare. They're high up in the food chain. They take a lot of energy to support their populations. So if you look at a natural population, you will find a lot of plant eaters, relatively few meat eaters. And that's what we see in this assemblage today. Just a few carnivorous bones versus a fair number of, of plant eating, of, of herbivore mammal bones. Uh, as has been noted and recently studied, you had saber-toothed cats and dire wolves at the La Brea Tar Pits. Apparently, they were partitioning the environment, uh, uh, whereas uh, saber-toothed cats may have eaten animals more like woodland animals, like tapirs, whereas dire wolves appear to have preferred animals like bison, more plains-adapted animals. And so you had this sort of thing going on at the La Brea Tar Pits, and now we can add these fossils from La Cienega Station, these non-asphaltic fossils, of saber-toothed cats into the story and determine that these animals were there too. If we find more of these fossils, it's possible they can be analyzed in the same manner and we can determine what these, these animals were doing in their environment as well. So all of this so far is kind of consistent with what we might expect to find uh, based on what has been learned at the La Brea Tarpets. 
What kind of caught us by surprise was the ground sloths. Yes, we found ground sloth remains. Yes, we are excited by ground sloth remains. And here's some of what we found. Uh, this is a femur, the upper hind leg bone on the left, and this is a, uh, a hand bone uh, from a, a smaller separate species known as Notherthereops on the right. So we've got, even with just these two fossils, we've got two different kinds of sloth represented. And this is exciting. Um, we were excited at the time because back in 2018, the La Brea Tar Pits Museum had what they called the Summer of Sloths. And it was an event to celebrate sloths and to, to emphasize the importance of sloth, how uh, cool the animals are, how important they were in their ecosystems, and how cool they were. I know I said that twice, but that's because they're so cool. And Cogstone Resource Management participated in that. We had our sloth femur on display in the uh, Fishbowl Laboratory at La Brea. And that was about the extent of our participation because that's about all we had in the way of sloths. Our timing wasn't great because we started finding sloths after the Summer of Sloths event ended and we found them at La Cienega Station. And we started finding clusters of sloth bones. We found huge numbers of sloth bones. Look at that lower jaw of a sloth. Here's how it came out. Here's how it cleaned out. It's a beautiful, nearly complete specimen lacking only the teeth. And again, this is not preserved in asphalt. This is natural preservation. And if you find a lower jaw, you'd hope to find a skull. Well, we did. There's the skull from the same animal. And we found multiple bones of this individual of sloth. We found multiple bones of other sloth individuals as well. Here's some of the vertebrae from that one individual, a thoracic uh, a, a cervical vertebra or neck vertebra, and then a caudal or tail vertebra. We also find bones like this leg bone. This is a femur. And if you look at that ball-shaped part of the femur on to the left of your screen, you'll can see that it's not fully fused onto the rest of the bone. That means that this was a sub-adult animal of sloth. It hadn't fully, it wasn't a full adult at the time the organism died. I emphasize that because we are finding multiple bones of sloths. And so if you look at these two shin bones from, from a sloth, the one on the right, if you look at the top of the bone, you can see that jaggedy line. That's another one of those places where the growth plate is fusing on. That was a subadult uh, shin bone, whereas the bone on the left is a fully adult animal. They're both from the same side of the body, so we know that they're two different individuals. We also know uh, that they were different ages when each of these animals died. We also found this pelvis in a different area. Uh, this is a relatively complete pelvis of a ground sloth, and this one got nicknamed Shakira because hips don't, oh, never mind. It, you get the joke. Anyway, this is nicknamed Shakira, uh, and this nickname is actually caught on in some of LA Metro's official correspondence, so we're quite happy to have a relatively complete sloth pelvis as well. I've mentioned the carnivorans, I've mentioned the saber-toothed cats, and I've mentioned the dire wolves and for just a second, and I know you guys are all remote and dialing in, and I don't know if you want to chat on this or not, but just put your thinking caps on and think about what kind of carnivoran might you find at the tar pits and not find somewhere else, or vice versa, what might you not find at the tar pits that you would find somewhere else, let's say, during the LA subway excavations, during the Purple Line extensions. Can you think of a carnivorin, a meat-eating mammal, that you wouldn't find at the La Brea Tar Pits? Even though the La Brea Tar Pits are a carnivorin trap, that's what they do is catch lots of saber-toothed cats, lots of dire wolves, short-faced bears, lots of coyotes, all sorts of, what carnivorin wouldn't you expect to find at the tar pits? Well, you ought to be able to guess because uh, it would be sea otters because these are marine animals or uh, because they're restricted generally to oceans and near water sources. They didn't get inland far enough to be at the La Brea Tar Pits and they certainly wouldn't be in a position um, uh, to be trapped in asphalt. That just, that's not necessarily going to work. Nevertheless, we do find sea otter remains, just a few, but we have found a couple of sea otter bones uh, as part of the excavations for the purple line. We found the humerus you see here on the left. That came from the San Pedro formation. That's that older unit. And the ulna, the lower forelimb bone on the right, uh, unusually came from Ice Age alluvium, which would suggest an, a freshwater uh, deposit, which you wouldn't expect to find uh, sea otters in. Nevertheless, that's the best identification we can put on this. 
we haven't necessarily studied these bones as much as we'd like uh, because sea otters are evil and we don't like them. And I don't know if you knew that sea otters were evil, but you should because they're all in Hydra. And you're welcome, the three people who got that joke. Anyway, all of this is just to give you just a taste of the kinds of organisms that are being found underneath the surface in the Los Angeles Basin. So for those of you who are excited by fossils, um, you don't necessarily need to just go to museums and you don't need to head out of state or out of the country to see them. They're below your feet right now. Even when you're sequestering at home and practicing self-isolation at home, if you're living in the flatland areas of Los Angeles, you have ice age animals almost certainly underneath your feet. Uh, don't tell your kids to dig up, the, dig up the yard. They'd have to go down 10 or 15 feet. You don't want that. Nevertheless, there are ice age animals almost certainly beneath your feet. And so those fossils are giving us a new picture of what the Los Angeles Basin was like. It's augmenting what we already knew. And all of this is being made possible by paleontological mitigation. So the development that you see going on around you is not just adding new infrastructure, it is also adding new knowledge and new, new fossils and new data and a new way of looking at things in paleontology. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up and open this up to uh, Becca and uh, any questions you all might have. So thanks very much for your patience. Um, thank you so much, Eric. I am going to start sharing my screen again so we can move on to some really exciting stuff. Um, before I start talking too much about the standards that we have um, to discuss, I do want to um, address a couple things that came up in the chat as this was going on. This is, we originally planned this as an educator workshop and a professional development opportunity, but we are finding we do have some students with us as well. So welcome to you. Um, we are going to send out a lesson plan and an activity um, to everyone who's registered after this workshop. It'll probably go out tomorrow. Um, if not Tomorrow, by the end of the week, you'll get it. Um, and also we understand maybe if people need to head out right at noon, that's totally fine. Again, this will be recorded. So if you don't get to see all of it, you can check out the last few minutes or so when, um, when that recording goes out. Um, and I think I have one other thing that I need to address really quick. Um, no, I think that might be it. Um, okay, so. Standards, so exciting. Um, I'm gonna go through this quickly because we do have a lot of really great questions that I wanna be able to get Eric's um, answers for if he's got them. Um, but so we were looking at next generation and common core state standards and classroom connections. Um, so we'd like to encourage you to think a little bit about how you can utilize some of this information and utilize the process of paleontology in your curriculum, in your classroom. And again, we do have some ideas for you that we'll share with you um, later this week. Um, but a lot of what Eric's work does addresses so many of the science and engineering practices, so many of those cross-cutting concepts, and of course the disciplinary core ideas. Um, we obviously can't list every single one because we don't want to get too boring after that really great presentation. Um, but basically some of the, some of the um, disciplinary core ideas that we pulled out for this particular topic include life sciences and understanding ecosystems, physical sciences and matter and its interactions, um, engineering, technology, applications of science, um, and then the earth sciences, of course, um, talking about the history of planet earth, um, plate tectonics, and large-scale system interactions. So those are all some, um, some great connections that we've made. Um, and if you have other ones that we maybe didn't think about, we'd love, we'd love for you to share that with us. Um, and then some common core connections. We are connecting, of course, with mathematics and reading and representing um, and interpreting data. Um, and then looking at patterns, solving real world problems. Um, and then, of course, looking at the English, English language arts and literacy. Um, you, Eric mentioned, you know, he, he publishes his work, so you have to be able to write arguments and support those claims using evidence. Um, and then prepare for various conversations and collaborations, just like what we're doing right now with, um, with Eric and, and his expertise with Cogstone Resource Management. 
Um, so that's very, very basic. Again, I want to make sure we have time for some of these Q&As. Um, if you have other questions that have come up, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A box now and we will um, try to answer as many as we can. Um, and we'll probably go maybe a few minutes over, um, but let's go ahead and get started. Are you ready for some of these great questions, Eric? I am. Okay, great. Um, so one that I found very interesting is how do you know for sure what an extinct animal looks like if you don't have proof? If I don't have? Proof. Um, that's a really good question. And the answer is we, uh, and I, when I say we, I mean other people. Um, I know what bones look like. And that's because that's what I studied. And so you have uh, a knowledge of anatomy. And honestly, I have it fairly easy because I study Ice Age animals. So I study bison. Well, we've got living bison today. I study horses. We've got horses today. Ground sloths are a little more unusual, but we do have living sloths today. Mammoths are a little unusual, but we have elephants today. And so people working in the Pleistocene can look at modern living animals and use them as examples of what the extinct animals look like because the bones of the animals look so close. The further back in time you go, the, the further back you look at things like dinosaurs and so forth, uh, the more artistic license comes in. But even artistic license, I don't want to imply that they're making it up. All of the paleontology artists I know, like Brian Eng, who we've talked about before, like the paleo artist Mark Hallett, by any, uh, any number of others, um, they base their work in what they know about living organisms and they have living examples. You may be familiar with the still ongoing discussion among dinosaur paleontologists about whether or not dinosaurs had birds specifically whether Tyrannosaurus rex, whether they had birds, whether they had feathers, I can't talk, um, whether Tyrannosaurus rex had feathers because dinosaurs and birds, uh, birds are dinosaurs. And so if birds have feathers, maybe dinosaurs did too. Maybe some dinosaurs did, other dinosaurs didn't. That is still a relatively new discovery. And so you have paleontology artists who are now changing some of the art that they would have done 10, 20, 30 years ago and changing the color palette of their dinosaurs, changing whether or not they had feathers, changing uh, the habitats they lived in. And all of that is artists using their knowledge, also using their creativity to reconstruct uh, what these animals might have looked like. So when I show you Brian Eng's artwork of a giant ground sloth, uh, that's his rendering based on his understanding of the anatomy, based on his understanding of the appearance of living sloths, and that art specifically was designed because he wanted to explore more of what their skull shape might have been and how it might have looked uh, in the living animal. And then the environment it lived in, that kind of cool foggy environment is based on some of the plant remains and the marine shells and so on that have been found in the fossil record from that region. So all of that kind of comes in together. Is conjecture involved? Yes. Uh, but that's true for a lot of science, where you have to uh, use your best understanding of uh, what's going on and then proceed from there. Great. Yeah. Uh, I, when you mentioned, you know, um, how the paleo artists are revising some of their work now, it just makes me think again, too. I'm sure teachers will, will understand what I'm saying with this is the nature of science and understanding that, you know, as you learn something new, your initial ideas may change and um, having some flexibility in that thought is really, really something interesting to think about. When I was, when I was young, I wanted to be a scientist and wanted to be a paleontologist, but because I was young, I had this idea that I was going to be the guy with all the answers and that that's what scientists were. And as I grew up and learned more about science, I realized that it is a constant process of asking questions. And so scientists are the ones, yes, they, we do have some answers, but we also ask questions and know how to address answering them. And it's a very different and utterly fascinating uh, way of doing things is to perpetually inquire about the natural world around us. Absolutely, yes, I agree with that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, kind of along that line, we, we found one question that, that we didn't know the answer to and we'd love to know if you know the answer to. John is wondering, do toenails of these animals decay? 
Ooh. Um, we don't find toenails um, unless one of our monitors has been trimming them, and they shouldn't do that on a construction site. Um, we don't find them at the La Brea Tar Pits. We also don't find hair at the La Brea Tar Pits, and the hair and fingernails actually, in terms of what they're made up of, are related, and that doesn't preserve in the tar pits. Uh, it usually doesn't preserve in the, what I'll call the normal fossil record. That said, there are exceptions to that. Um, if you go to Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, there is a cave outside of Las Vegas called Gypsum Cave. It was excavated in the 1930s, so there's no fossils in it anymore. But it actually produced a variety of fossils, including ground sloth remains, and it produced ground sloth hair, and it produced ground sloth poop, and it also produced ground sloth claws. And so claws are made up of the same stuff as our fingernails. And so there are some instances where you can find fossilized remains of things like uh, fingernails and toenails. We haven't found anything like that on the subway. They haven't found anything like that at the La Brea Tar Pits, but it does sometimes happen. Fantastic. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. No one can see you speaking. I apologize for that. Uh -huh. It's maybe not a bad thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my I'm gonna turn off my screen share and we'll go into gallery view so everyone can see us. Um, fantastic. Okay, that's so interesting. I I didn't even first of all I didn't think of a question like that. I, I never imagined thinking about animal toenails, but it's very interesting to to think about how those are um, preserved or not. Um, so very cool. Thank you for the, sharing the, that. The fossils uh, the fossils from Gypsum Cave are actually at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And so they're, and they're just beautiful. It's, it's a, it's a claw that's like that long and oh, wow. it's just beautifully, and there's clumps of hair and, and literally boxes of sloth poop, um, which are important. It's not just let's collect the poop. It's, you can determine what the animal was eating exactly specifically what it was. You don't need to draw inferences. You actually see what the animal was consuming. Right. Um, another quick, Question. Let's see. Let's we'll probably have time for maybe two more questions. Um, have you been able to identify what type of carnivore chewed some of these animals due to bite marks? I am not a specialist at that. Um, I actually know a specialist or two at that, and and I'd like to bring her in at, at, on this at some point. But we aren't at that stage yet, and uh, it might not happen because it's not necessarily required as part of a mitigation program, whereas uh, that scientist could study this material after it ends up at the museum if she is so inclined. But my guesstimate, my professional estimation would be that it was probably a canid, like a dire wolf. Um, Saber-tooth cats, we don't know that they scavenged, and I don't know that they would have scavenged by leaving puncturing marks in the bone. And the punctures are about the right size for a wolf, and they're too small for something like a short-faced bear. So my guess would be it was something like a wolf. I also don't think it would be a North American lion. But I'm not a specialist, so that is my interpretation, but I sure wouldn't go out on a limb and publish on that. I'd much rather a carnivorin, carnivorin ravaging expert uh, weigh in on that and make that determination. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, we have so many great questions. I'm going to give you one more um, and then we'll probably wrap up just because we're already a little bit over our time. So I want Sorry. to make sure. That's okay. That's okay. We, we, we added a little bit in the, in the beginning that initially we hadn't um, anticipated. So uh, not a problem. Um, we've got a question. Um, where do you obtain funding for digging identification and research? And does La Brea Tar Pits get self-funding? Funding is one of the key issues these days. Um, again, with paleontological mitigation, uh, the funding is provided by the person doing the development. So in order for them to pull a building permit or a construction permit, they are required to demonstrate that, yes, we have retained the service of a paleontologist. And it's not just paleontology. They've got to do that for, excuse me, for archaeology, uh, for biology, if there's any uh, species that might be impacted. And all of that is required by the California Environmental Quality Act, as well as by ordinances within LA County and other municipalities. So that's pretty standard. The funding for that comes from the, the, the entity performing the construction, the development. That said, we are obligated not to take advantage of that. 
Um, I can't just, well, I want to go to study zebras in Africa and, and bill it to the client. It doesn't work that way. I'm responsible for making sure that we have done our best effort to recover the fossils, to preserve the fossils, to make sure they're clean, prepared, stabilized, and ready to go to a museum, and that I've assessed their significance, that I've assessed their scientific importance, which is kind of what you've seen today, is identifying them, determining what they mean, what they can tell us, and then that's about it. Once this mitigation project is finished, these fossils will go to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, except for the asphalt bones. They're going to the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. If we find any more fossils that are in an asphaltic context, they also go to the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. And at that point, any scientist who wants to can study them. Other institutions like museums, like universities, get their funding from other sources, whether it's from tax dollars or from private donations and so on. But so if I wanted to do research, I would do it on my own time and either with my own finances or with finances that I obtain from another source. I wouldn't do it with part of the mitigation contracts. Any research, quote unquote, that we do here is specifically towards assessing the significance of the fossils so that we can demonstrate to the client that we have collected fossils that actually do have scientific importance, that are informative, and that are worth preserving. Well, thank you for that. That's very interesting. And I can speak, um, we excavate at the tar pits almost every day uh, up until, um, you know, obviously closures due to COVID-19. Um, so we have it in our budget to excavate, at least in our, on our property, some of the deposits that we've got at Project 23 and where I am right now in Pit 91. Um, that's something that we excavate in the summer. And, and then Project 23 is something that we excavate every day up until now. Um, so thank you again, Eric, for joining us and sharing your time and your expertise. It's always so great to talk to you and hear about all the work that you're doing with Cogstone. Um, I do want to say we have a lot more questions that are really great that um, we don't have, um, ha have time to answer. Sorry, I was getting some notes from my team here to um, ask you where you are. Some people are asking about your background. Are you at work right now? I am at work. At your office. And I'm only coming to work because there's nobody else here. So all of the surfaces here have been cleaned and and are still regularly cleaned. But again, I'm the only person coming in and out. So there's no, if I'm carrying the virus, I've already got it. If I'm not carrying the virus, I'm not bringing it in. So, but if we, if I had to bring the team back to start working in the lab, I would probably go back to staying at home because I can do a lot of what I do here uh, at home whereas working with the fossils needs to take place here. So we are adjusting, but at the moment I'm at the office. Great, great. All right, well, we will try to answer some of these questions later via email if, we, if we're if we able to. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, please be sure to sign up for our teacher email mailing list, our newsletter list. Um, it'll let you know about all of our events, all of our professional development, all of our programs for our students and um, classrooms that as they become available, we are still developing a lot of that. Um, and, you know, as we transition into our new virtual reality. Um, so again, we just want to say thank you. If you have any other questions, you can contact us at school programs, um, the school programs email school programs at tarpits.org. Um, and again, thank you and have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.